Welcome back to Time Out with the Sports Doctor podcast, where life, sports, and medicine intersect. We're very glad that you continue to support this podcast. You can get the information on any platform uh, where podcasts are played, as well as getting the video content on YouTube. But if you want to just get one place to find all the content, go to my website at drgarrickthesportsdoctor.com and you will find everything on that website. So without further ado, let's get into this episode. All right, so welcome back to another episode of Time Out with the Sports Doctor podcast. We have another very special guest today, uh, Dr. Stephanie Pearson who is a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist, and now currently the CEO of Pearson Rabbits, who specializes in insurance for healthcare workers. But hey, here we are. Thank you for being with me today. And this is going to be a great conversation um, and that will be able to help many healthcare workers and physicians. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Happy to All be right. here. All right. So if you could tell us, though, that you're an obstetrician gynecologist by training, and tell us about why you chose that field, number one, and kind of how that shaped what you're doing now. So it's funny as an orthopedist that you're asking me why I chose OBGYN, because I <laughs> actually, well, it was very circuitous, as I think are most of us who enter med school. I actually went to med school to be a pediatrician. I thought I wanted to be my pediatrician. I spent 12 weeks shadowing one and kind of wanted to poke my eyeballs out. I was like, oh my God, if I have to look in ears and throats for my career, that's not going to work. Thank you to all the pediatricians out there. You guys are rock stars. I can't do what you do. And then I did my surgery rotation thinking I didn't want to have anything to do with surgery. And I got to spend some time with some orthopedists particularly a pediatric orthopedist who was amazing. And I was like, I need to do research with him and I want to do pediatric ortho, but oh my God, I have to do an adult ortho residency to try to match into peds and, but too risky, (laughs) right? No, but I set myself on that path. I was literally, I was doing research at Penn. I set my sub eye up. It was all there. And then my last rotation of third year was my OBGYN rotation, which I purposefully planned at a hospital on the beach, thinking I would do what I needed to do to get by and be on the beach every day. And little did I know how much surgery OBGYNs did and spending time with Gyne Unc and your, you know, Eurogyne. And I was like, wow, this is actually really fun. And I have pretty good hands. And so I, true story, walked into my OBGYN, who'd been taking care of me since I was like 15, sat in his office and cried and said, I don't know what to do. Everything's lined up for ortho. I don't think I want to do that anymore. I want to do OBGYN. Can you help me get a sub eye at Pennsylvania Hospital? They don't have one. Yeah. And he was generous enough to make a couple phone calls. I got a sub eye and proved to them that I, I mean, you know, in hindsight, I proved to them that I deserve to be there uh, and ended up an OBGYN. Um, so it was very circuitous. It was not at all what I thought I would do. I got to practice for almost 10 years. I The OR is my happy place. I did enjoy office GYN. You know, OB is a mixed bag, right? At two in the afternoon, it's awesome. At two in the morning, <laughs> on day two of no sleep, not so awesome. Right. But, you know, I, I got to live the happiest moments of people's lives with them. It was just when things were bad they were really bad. Unfortunately, my career came to a halt. I had been called down to do a precipitous delivery. She was lovely. I actually delivered three of her other kids. Baby number four should have just fallen out, right? But unfortunately, she arrived uh, complete. She didn't get an epidural. 
It's called labor, not a walk in the park. And typically I'll step back and say, look, you do you have the baby, I'll fix the carnage. But I looked down and the baby's heart rates were tanking and the head was right there. I literally just needed her to push and she wouldn't. So I had multiple nurses in the room with me. Um, and as I put the vacuum on the baby's crown, she kicked me. Um, the first kick came straight to my brachial plexus. My left arm went numb. I tilted my body thinking I was doing myself a favor. And as I got kind of the widest part of the baby's abdomen out, she managed to drop two of my nurses, kicked me a second time and kind of came across my shoulder. And I just knew something was wrong. I ended up in tears. My partner came in, helped me. Now kind of long story short, I ended up with a torn labrum. I was told it would heal. It didn't. I developed a frozen shoulder, had surgery, was told I'd be back to work in 12 weeks. And that was nine and a half years ago. I have considerable range of motion deficits and nerve damage to this day. I was not cleared to do OB or operate. And my surgeon actually put in black and white that I was a liability. And at the time, I was furious. Time, age, and wisdom, he did me a favor because I probably would have tried to go back and push myself and bad things could have happened, right? So August 3rd of this year will be 10 years. I learned a lot the hard way about disability insurance and then subsequently life insurance and really became passionate about the topic. And it wasn't the first thing that I decided to do. It wasn't like this aha moment. Oh my God, now I'm going to do insurance, right? Like I don't think any physician, I'm sure there's some, I shouldn't talk in definitives, but most of us don't look at ourselves as salespeople, right? We're right. healers, we're educators. And I really never thought about it initially. I did a few other things. I didn't love what I was doing and realized that a lot of my friends were just asking me to look at their stuff. You know, kind of the, you hear the bad story and, oh my God, I want to make sure I'm protected and it's not going to happen to me. Right. And so I felt like the only way for me to ethically do that was to get licensed. So it was not an overnight comeuppance. It was probably, let me see, I was operated on in 2013. It's now 2023. Our company is five and a half years old. I was doing it for about a year by myself. So, you know, it, it was a good three, four year gestation of me convalescing into this role. Sure, sure. Wow, so much to unpack from that because number one, you know, I felt a lot of sadness listening to, you know, we talked about how does this all come together, life, sports, and medicine, right? And what do we have in common? Well, you know, at first you mentioned orthopedics. So you start off this search and we start off this search at such a young age, this journey to become a physician. And we are really just kind of pulling things out of our hats. Oh, I think I want to do this. I think I want to do that. But it's truly not until you're a third or fourth year medical student that you ever really get a good experience to say, okay, yeah, you know what? I, I said I want to be an orthopedic surgeon when I was 16. I really want to be an orthopedic surgeon. And then you say, okay, I'm moving away from orthopedics to OBGYN. And then in the midst of a game-like situation, you had to make a game uh, in-game decision, right? And I want to get this baby out as healthy as possible. And I'm willing to risk my health, my body, put my body on the line, like we do in sports, every game, every time you mm -hmm. step out on a field, which led to a major injury, and it brings you back to orthopedics, mm -hmm. right? And then in orthopedics, we think, okay, you have an injury, you tore your labrum, sure, surgery, when will I be back? People, they walk in the first day and say, I'm injured, ACL tear. Okay, I'm crying. What day will I be back? And it's supposed to be just that simple. Surgery, return to play. 
surgery, return to work. And it's not that simple as your story tells us. So and I, I you will, for, you know, I ahead. will tell you that my first orthopedist told me that professional baseball pitchers pitched with torn labrums, I should be able to do my job. And it was kind of like getting punched in the face sure. because I was like, do you remember your OBGYN rotation? And, but I did what I think most of us would do. I took the cortisone shot. I put my head down and I went back into the game and right. I figured out how to compensate. And it was eight months before I got another physician who was like, this is a textbook frozen shoulder. What have you been doing? And I'm like, doing what I was told to do, which interestingly leads into some of the harsh learning that I had in that our group disability insurance and fine print didn't cover work-related injuries. So I was completely denied and told I would have been better off had I fallen off my bike. And Workman's Comp actually denied my first claim because they said, well, an injury occurred, my frozen shoulder was idiopathic or my fault because I continued to work while I was injured. But who doesn't? Wow. Right? Yeah. Like, wow. that's what we do. It's such a complex story because what we do, and especially prior to the pandemic, you go to work, rain, sleep, shine, sick, illness, whatever. Right. You know, you're in the OR, you're taking a steroid shot so you can continue to operate. You know, you're drinking Gatorade between cases <laughs> when you're completely sick just so you can stand and operate on another sick person. Been We've really been it. taught how to abuse ourselves repeatedly from our years of training. So now that you're out and you really have people depending on you, what other decision would you make other than I'm going to push through this because people need me, my exactly. patients need me. My partners need me. What am I going to do? What are they going to do if I fall off the call schedule? Right? Mm -hmm. So we often put other people above ourselves routinely. Um, so like you mentioned, you got medical advice, said, okay, injection therapy, push through it. Yeah. You try to push through it, developed a frozen shoulder, which we all know, you know, and I know is very ambiguous and it can be you're better in six weeks or you're better in three or four years. I don't know if they gave you the story that frozen shoulder will eventually thaw out. Okay. It might take years and years and years. I am still in physical therapy once a week. Interestingly, in 2021, I woke up with a frozen right shoulder. So now there is some question as to why, you know, I'm not a diabetic. I'm not a smoker. I don't have any underlying reason to have two shoulders that don't work. You know, who knows? Maybe I have an underlying connective tissue disease or some hyper autoimmune thing, but I'm not getting tested because I don't want it on, in my medical records. But no, I mean, it's, I always say that there's a tyranny of perfection that exists in medicine that gets perpetuated from the day we start med school. And we're supposed to be better than, stronger than, smarter than, tougher than, right? We're actually not allowed to be human. And right. I do think it's gotten better since I started. I'm a bit older than you. I think it's gotten better. I still don't think it's great. I mean, look, we still lose a physician to suicide every day. So there's still some work to be had in how we treat ourselves and how we treat each other, I will tell you that physicians were some of the meanest people to me after everything happened. I think partly because it is an invisible disability that there were days where I wished that I was in a cast or in a wheelchair or didn't have to defend myself every time the topic came up because invariably a physician would look at me and say, you look fine. What do you mean you can't do your job? And I would have to go through the motions of raise your hand up above your head and they would do it. And then I would raise my arm up and it would 
you know, maybe get to 90 degrees on a good day. I get to 110, 115. And I'm like, look, if you're, could I deliver a normal spontaneous vaginal delivery? Probably, but so could my 16 year old, right? Where we shine is when there are problems. And if I was faced with a dystocia right now, I couldn't get my arm in the position that I need it to be. Could I do 12 deliveries in a row, right? On a busy day? There's no way, but I look fine, you know? And it's been almost 10 years. I still have to defend myself at certain times. And I can always tell the way that somebody's looking at me. I mean, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and a physician came up to me and kind of like tongue in cheek was like, oh, maybe I should do insurance and get out of medicine. Lucky you, medicine's in the shitter. And then I said my story and she was like, oh my God, I was so insensitive. I'm so sorry. And I was like, yeah, I'd still be in medicine if my shoulders worked. Yeah. You know, and I realized I kind of got off topic, but something made me think of that. If you're enjoying this episode, don't wait to the end to share it. Share it now. Share this with a friend or a colleague that you think might find value in this information. And then also make sure that you click and leave us a five star review and give us feedback because we really value your feedback and your input. Now back to the episode. No, absolutely. But that's important because we endure these things as physicians. Um, and many times we have to do it in silence because you don't want to put your job at risk. Um, you don't want to be ridiculed or scrutinized by your partners or by your uh, colleagues. And we suffer in silence many times, not yeah. only physical, but also mentally uh, from mental stress and from mental illness, uh, because we're always worried about what if. What if my patients find out? What if my colleagues find out? What if my employer finds out? Like you mentioned, what if my life insurance finds out that I'm, I have an illness that hasn't been reported yet? Right. So it's a lot of stress that we go through to perform, to help people, simply right. to help people, you yeah. know? And as you mentioned, kind of reading about your company, our biggest asset is ourselves, right? Yeah. The ability to be able to work, to produce. Um, right. We're not going to even get into passive income because so many of us are focused on just showing up every day, yeah. working as hard as we can for as long as we can right. to hopefully be able to pay back student loans, to live decently, you know, um, so provide for our kids, I mean, provide I, for our family and try to build a legacy, right? You know, I was the primary breadwinner. My husband's amazing. He is a flight nurse, critical care nurse by training. And uh, at the time I got hurt, I was making probably three times what he was making. And I thought that I was better off to them dead. I knew wow. how much life insurance I had. I already told you how, you know, the disability stuff started to unfold. I wrote letters. I mean, I had a plan and I was getting serious psychiatric help. But to add to everything, you have this loss of identity. You have a, you know, the pressure of your family. And he was amazing. I mean, he took a couple of traveling jobs just to make quick money fast, but that also took him away from us. You know, I needed help in ways I would have never thought that I needed help. It was a really dark time. I mean, I did not realize at the time how much of my identity was tied to being Dr. Pearson. I didn't change my name when I got married. I was always the one that was like, whatever name is on my diploma is the name I'm keeping, right? Right. It's how everybody knew me. And to top on that, to kind of pull the sports thing back in, I was an adrenaline junkie. And so I did martial arts. I was a rock climber. I was a skydiver. I couldn't do any of that either. 
So on the other hand, I had people saying, oh, well, you're not working. You must be fill in the blank, right? Playing right. tennis, having lunch with the ladies, pick up golf. And I'm like, none of those work with a bum arm. So it wasn't even like I could leave medicine to enjoy the hobbies that I had. Like I really, and I don't mean this to sound hyperbolic, but I lost everything. And it took a long time for me to kind of come out of that hole. Yeah. So, you know, thank you again for sharing. Um, but because I feel like when we share our failures and we share our struggles, that's where we really connect with people on um, a, a level that's much deeper than just telling, oh, I'm a doctor. Oh, I'm an OBGYN. Oh, I did great and mighty things, yeah. you know, because everyone struggles, but many people struggle alone. So to know that someone else was able to be on the brink, sounds like a brink of suicide even, and be able to pull your way out of that um, can save somebody else. So just talk to us about how you coped with that. Because like you mentioned, you lost your identity. Not only did you lose your identity as a physician, but also the things that kept you healthy from an exercise standpoint and an activity standpoint, you lost all of it at the same time. So talk about that. So I started off in really intensive outpatient psychiatric therapy. So thank you to all the psychiatrists out there, uh, better living through pharmacology and therapy for me. It may not be for everybody. Some of it was latching on to the few people who were supportive. I was fortunate enough that one of my senior partners had also gone out on disability much older than me, you know, had his successful OBGYN career, but was also forced, you know, and I put forced in, in air quotes, you know, forced out of practice because of muscular, other musculoskeletal issues. But the two of us were be eight, were able to go to the gym together, to do our water therapy together, to talk really about what we were both going through I have an incredibly supportive family. My, you know, I joked about this with you earlier, but at one point, my husband and boys, they were four and six when everything happened. They brought home a puppy and I wanted to kill them all. And my husband said, look, the boys and I are just not enough. And we're okay with that right now you have a choice. You can be surrounded by filth. We're not taking care of this dog. You are. So get out of bed, start taking care of something that needs your help and get back to what you're good at. And I cried and cried and cried, fell in love with a baby bull mastiff and got out of my own way. You know, I started taking her on long walks and going to the dog park. And guess what? At the dog park, no one knew me as Dr. Pearson. I was Stephanie Kim's mom, right? <laughs> like they knew the dog. Right. I, and I didn't have to talk about what was going on. Like, I, I don't know if you've had the pleasure of going to dog parks, but like people tend to talk about everyday weird stuff, right? What are your kids okay. doing? Mostly about your dogs, right? And I realized that there was a lot that I still had to offer. I realized that while historically walking was not my choice of activity, but taking a dog on a one hour walk is exercise, you know? And I had to kind of find some new things. I always loved cooking. So I really kind of doubled down on, on cooking. It let me use my hands again in a different way, but I felt like I was still producing. I've had a recent epiphany. Wow. I almost started to cry. I'm going to try to get through this without crying. So I had really bad COVID last week and historically I've been able to work sick right? We already kind of touched on that part. Right. I could not do anything. 
uh, for four days, I was out. I had to cancel meetings. I had crazy guilt about canceling meetings. I had crazy anxiety about not cooking dinner for my kids who are now 14 and 16. And I had a resounding epiphany that even now, right, 10 years later, I still put a lot of my self-worth in doing and producing and accomplishing. And we're talking about four days that I still did not have the grace to give myself a break and literally was apologizing to my husband and kids for being useless. And they looked at me and they're like, what are you talking about? You did not choose to have COVID. You did not choose that it was going to knock you out like this. It's okay to take a break. And I'm like, huh, wise children, you know? And yes, I have my work cut out for me for my therapist this week, but it never, it doesn't change in, in the like how we value ourselves. And yeah, so it's been an interesting week, Derek, um, sure. but- it it does tie back to how we how I was as a physician that I didn't lose that right. I kind of wish I had and even now you know yesterday and today just about every email I send out starts with thank you for your patience I had COVID last week and it kicked my ass right mm -hmm. I'm now just getting caught up do I really need to preface all of my emails like that probably not. But it's still that ingrained intern, right, yes. of you need to get back to people in this amount of time. And, you know, this is what's acceptable and this is what's not acceptable. And it's a work in progress. You know, yeah. we, we are all a work in progress. Yeah, we are, you know, wired to that's what makes you a successful physician. And many times a successful entrepreneur is having that probably I'm not going to I'm not going to take no for an answer. I'm going to push through whatever jumps in my way. I'm going to find a way to get it done. And when mm -hmm. we can't do that, it's a tough pill to swallow. Like you mentioned, yeah. you're sick and you're apologizing. <laughs> um, as you were talking, I thought about an affirmation that I had to embrace. And that's I give up being perfect for being authentic because Ooh, I like that. You know, so many times. I want to be perfect, even if it means that I'm compromising who I am as a person, because I want you to be happy with me, right? Mm -hmm. um, but once I've kind of grown, and it's still a process to be who I am, whether you like it or not, um, whether you accept me or not, it's been, it's given me a freedom that I never had before. Because before then, there's no way I would sit here behind this microphone week in and week out and share my thoughts or have these conversations with people. Because what if somebody at the job listens and they don't like what I say? Or what if, you know, I tell something and somebody doesn't like it? Somebody, people are not going to like you know, someone broken into thirds. Some people are going to love you no matter what you do. Some people are going to just say fine and ignore you. And some people are going to hate you no matter what you do. So, yeah, definitely, like you said, this conversation has gone way different than what we predicted. But I told you before we start it, that's how it tends to work. Uh, because what needs to be said, is going to be said. And that's what beauty behind the podcast. And that's what I've learned over these last almost two years. So well, I'm stealing that affirmation from you because I could use it. Please do. Please do. All right. So let's talk about um, Pearson rabbits mm -hmm. and how, I mean, you're still helping physicians. Now you might not be helping patients hands-on, but you're still helping physicians be whole um, by the work that you're doing. Now. This brings us to the end of part one of this two-part episode, but join in next week to hear how Dr. Pearson used her unfortunate situation to help other medical providers avoid that same end to their career. Until then, be blessed. Never stop it. You are now tuned in. Trust.
you don't want to miss. This is where life, sports, and medicine.